tanks kept going up and down our street. So they needed all the lawyers that they could get their hands on. My grandmother's in tears. I will go to my death believing police officers killed the kids at that motel. There were threats that maybe, you know, the people who lived in the big houses and, and, and uh, regardless of race would, uh, would not fare well um, as things progressed. That not just stores might be um, uh, looted or burned, but some of the homes as well. My father came home after three days because there was a rumor as the riot had continued to take on very significant intensity. People had died at that point, not the entire 43. I don't know what the um, account was, but it was clearly in the high 20s by the third day. But there was a rumor that people had decided that they were going to come to the Boston Edison neighborhood, which was then largely African American, but the houses were three to 4,000 square feet. Uh, these were historic homes that had been built largely in the 1920s. Uh, and the rumor was, was that people were going to come and burn them down. My father came home uh, to protect his family. My father, a former Detroit policeman, uh, came home with a very, very large rifle. Uh, and, and he got there at about 5 o'clock, explained to my mother and I what the situation was. And my mother said, OK. Uh, my father said, I'm going to sit here out front uh, and, and, and uh, protect the house. Uh, and so my mother said, OK, and said to me, when it began to get dark, come in. My father said, no, uh, Conrad's going to sit here with me. Uh, he has as much responsibility to protect the house as I do. Uh, he did not give me a gun or anything like that. He said, your job is to make sure that I stay awake. So it was me and my father and my dog. And all night long, Rob, tanks kept going up and down our street. I saw tanks rolling down West Grand Boulevard. I, I, I see in my mind uh, these tanks rumbling by Henry Ford Hospital. I see National Guardsmen uh, up on 12th Street or Linwood. And so it was decided that we would um, leave my grandmother's house and go to my mother's house, which was um, off Seven Mile Road. And we took some of the things that were in my mother, grandmother's house, those things that you can't replace, those things that you care about most. And so the car was full of things as we proceeded north on Linwood passing Central High School, which is where the National Guard was encamped. And I remember being stopped by the National Guard and questioned, and my grandmother's in tears. And the adrenaline of that um, incidence and ultimately, we were able to, to proceed and to, to go on to my mother's house. But it was a scary, scary time. I simply say those were the five worst days of my life. Uh, very simply stated, five worst days of my life. Walter Ruther, God bless him, uh, called them the days of madness. And I don't think there has ever been a better description than, than his. They were days of madness. I, I remember my dad taking his shotgun and, and uh, patrolling the neighborhood, saying that they were going to burn the store where he gets the milk for his children. I'm from a family of 12. So dad was very protective of, of us and our neighborhood store. We were impacted by the riots uh, in Russell Woods, uh, in the, right down Dexter Avenue. I mean, we had the fires. Uh, we had tanks in the National Guard literally running down Dexter Avenue. It was a, a major impact. The curfew was in place. so. Uh, my friends and I, we couldn't, couldn't be out after dark. Um, it was some pretty harrowing times. Loitering, obviously during a time where you are under martial law and strict curfews, it's against the law. Yeah. So you'd be picked up. 
after the, uh, they started processing him, they didn't have enough defense lawyers. And the voluntary organization that provided defense lawyers for folks in court, pro bono, simply couldn't handle that. So the Sharp Bar Association had a program of bringing in volunteer lawyers. I guess there were six or seven hundred of them to represent these folks in recorder's court because the norms of the law were followed. Judges were calling on all lawyers. Remember, I'm a law student, but calling on all lawyers irrespective of their uh, particular expertise, uh, whether it was in transactional work, corporate work, etc. They needed all the lawyers that they could get their hands on to come down and to represent people who were arrested and were on Bill Isle. And uh, they were behind a wire. They needed lawyers to stand up with the people who were arrested so that they could be told, they meaning the, the person arrested, why they were being arrested, see if there was a officer or whomever was there that could say this is why the person was arrested. And the judge could make a, could make a decision whether or not the person should receive a fine or should be uh, detained or let go. But they needed to bring thousands of people before the judges in recorder's court. Um, I was dispatched to the Algiers Motel. I will go to my death believing police officers killed the kids at that motel. They were later tried in an all-white little city, Mason, Michigan, for the homicides that took place there. They were acquitted, but um, <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you not look back on that and not be affected by it? This was a, an enormous wound that had been opened up into the fabric of the city that we grew up in and loved. And now, now what do you do?